The classic longboard was over seven and a half feet long, made of balsa with redwood stiffening. The first big innovation was a single deep fin at the tail which added stability. The surfer could now do wide turns by shifting his weight around, and he could hold the board in the wave face and perform tricks right over the nose. In the 60s, new materials developed in the West Coast aircraft industry. Polyurethane foam, fiberglass and resin allowed boards to become stronger, lighter and more buoyant, leading to new levels of performance. The surfer began to ride up as well as down the wave, so boards shrunk in size. He could move right back to the tail, using it as a pivot in sharp turns. Designers chased details that would exploit the wave's energy rather than just going with the flow. The 70s saw the beginning of competitive surfing, and the boards grew narrower, more curved and shorter still. Today's no-fear aerials and slides are only possible on short boards. Science, how does it relate to these little plastic devices, motion devices? Well, the definition of science is accumulated knowledge and its application. And here before us is a beautiful example of that. Notice how it rocks continually, no straight spots. How the rocker is designed for if you're running down a bumpy wave, nothing will catch. It'll release all the way to the end. This is a high performance surfboard for a guy who spent a lot of dedicated hours. Designed for small waves, maybe two to four feet. Surfers don't know why their surfboards work, but the science of naval architecture has a pretty good idea. And basically, a surfboard represents two kinds of boats. One is a displacement hull, and the other is a planing hull. Now, while the surfer is paddling his surfboard, it's basically a displacement hull. It displaces water to keep itself afloat. Once the surfer catches the wave, however, it becomes a planing hull. His paddling speed is now augmented by the slope of the wave and the accelerations of the wave, which are pushing him forward. And that will be enough to break him past his hull speed and into a condition where the water passing under the board is creating an upward lift. And in that condition, he's just like a wing. His most critical maneuver at that point is his, his trimming adjustment in order to uh, uh, match his gravity accelerations to the hydrodynamic accelerations of the wave. Once the surfer is planing down the wave, his body and his board are gathering momentum. Physicists call this kinetic energy. By the time he reaches the bottom of the wave, he's got a tremendous inventory or excess of kinetic energy available to manipulate. And the first thing he'll do is a bottom turn. He'll give up some of that kinetic energy in doing the bottom turn because every turn intrinsically makes more spray and more drag. But even after that bottom turn, he'll have enough kinetic energy to glide up to the top of the wave again. Surfing involves the continual adjustment of wave and board interaction. Nowhere more so than in the tube or the barrel of the wave. He usually comes off a bottom turn into the tube. At that point, he has kinetic energy in excess, but he's going to continue to gain energy because the tube itself uh, is traveling forward at the phase speed. And as long as uh, he can maintain himself in that position, he'll continue to derive kinetic energy from that. What he's doing at that point is, is a high energy dance with the wave. If he reconverts his energy too rapidly by sliding further down the tube, he may run right out the front end of it. Or if he doesn't reconvert energy fast enough, he'll drift back inside the tube and be trapped. Board design is a complex game of mix and match. 
since minute changes in any one feature affects all the others. The most crucial aspect of design is the fin. Designers experiment with their shape, number, depth, angle and placement, striving for a compromise between grip in the water and maneuverability. The standard formula is three shallow fins. The tail is where the surface stands and steers. Shortening the tail reduces surface area and therefore drag. The pintail increases speed but lessens control. The swallowtail adds stability in steep banking turns. The curve of the board from the nose to the tail is called the rocker. Extra curve in the nose helps the board plane over the water and prevents it from snagging in the face of the wave. A raised tail keeps the fins half out of the water until the surfer presses down hard when turning, establishing tight control. Boards have a wide range of bottom shapes. A flat bottom is fast but difficult to control, so bottom features like concaves and convexes affect water pressure and ease the flow under the board. The outer edge is called the rail. Rounded or soft edges cause water to wrap around them so they add grip to turns. Hard rails release water swiftly so they increase speed but reduce control. Rocker, rail, bottom contour, tail and fin are the basic elements in the art of board design. But the search for the perfect board begins with raw materials. Woodworkers' fantasy having a whole tree. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you how happy, you know, well, how exciting this is for me. This tree is less than 20 years old because where it's standing now, there was a big core tree when I was a young kid. That core tree died about 20 years ago, and this tree came up in the, in the space that it made when it fell. This is a rare event. Mature trees on Hawaii are like listed monuments. You need a license to chop them down. Material, hardwood, softwood, or foam and fiberglass, each board is made with traditional carpenter's tools using planes, saws, spoke shaves, and routers. A longboard classic like this takes three weeks to build and costs upwards of $3,000. A new balsa wood board. I can't wait to see it. Woohoo! Yeah! Check this thing out. Wow! I don't believe it. Look at this piece. It looks like the, the cosmos or the universe, all the planets in the solar system. This is really an extraordinary board. And it was a pleasure to build. <laughs> Wooden boards are for the rich or the obsessive. 99% of modern boards can weigh as little as six pounds, and they're shaped from molded polyurethane blanks. These are called close tolerance blanks. It's a relatively new development in surfboard technology. This blank is very close to finished thickness. It's actually dual density. The exterior density is tighter and higher, and it's much stronger in the outside. The interior density is where the low density foam is, and it's softer. This blank is called a close tolerance blank because it's really, f it's almost a finished surfboard. 
what we do is we order our own custom rockers, which most closely approximate our design. And it's a very easy thing to do to find the board within. All that's left of traditional material is a central stringer running the length of the board. Two thin pieces of wood of opposing grain glue together for strength and rigidity. But foam shaping still needs the old hands-on skill of the artisan. It's called turning the rails. I'm actually cutting a specific contour in. The rail maintains contact with the water when you're surfing and basically has a lot to do with how the surfboard feels under the surfer's feet. Like this board will be very loose rail to rail. It'll go from maneuver to maneuver very easily. If I was to do a fuller rail with more foam in it, it would feel stiffer, but the board would have more drive out of a turn. And so what I'm doing is setting up a specific contour for this rider. This board has a concave from the stringer to the rail with channels cut in. And what channels basically do is they add a lot of lateral stability. When you're doing a bottom turn on a wave, the board's moving subtly laterally across the water, and the channels limit that lateral movement. And it's basic physics, it gives you thrust. You know, so the board tends to have a little bit more drive and acceleration out of the turn, but it just makes for a more dynamic surfer. See, a lot of the measuring you're doing is actually with your hands. You're using your hand as a profile gauge, checking the radius of the rail. You actually couldn't really use a carpenter's profile gauge too, very efficiently because it would put marks in the foam. So you're relying on your eyes and your hands to do a lot of the measuring. It's amazing how accurate you can get. Typically in our industry, the accepted standard is within an eighth of an inch. It's considered reasonably close but uh, most good craftsmen will get their work to within a 32nd of an inch tolerance, and that's acceptable. The surfer generally won't notice it. If you have a variation of an eighth of an inch in the design, the surfer will pick it up in the way the board feels. A good surfer will. But a 32nd of an inch difference, nobody notices. They might tell you they do. Every shaper's designs really mirror his relationship with the ocean and his development as an athlete out in the ocean. Like, my background has been in performance surfing, and so my boards tend to be a little bit more performance-oriented. You can shape anything because you know, you're a tenured craftsman, but typically your boards tend to lean in the direction your personality would go. Uh, this is 12,500 boards I've shaped. <laughs> it's a six-foot-three, uh, two-and-an-eighth-inch thick at center, swallowtail channel bottom concave. <laughs> After the plank is shaped, it's laminated with fiberglass cloth and resin. Layers and patches add strength, especially to the deck. Even in this large factory, boards are made to measure in the style of a bespoke tailor. You can have your own board shaped, painted, glassed, and finned to order for less than Waves like these carry an impact pressure of one and a half tons at 50 miles per hour. That's why they're called Maccas, because they hit you with the force of a speeding Mack truck. Such awesome energy comes not from ocean currents, nor phases of the moon, but solely from storm wind. If you have a flat sea and a gentle wind blowing on it, the first wave you'll see is called a ripple. What you're seeing is the energy moving through the water. The water doesn't move. Like if you were to be holding a rope and you were to do that to it, you'd get 
a wave of energy moving along the rope. And as the wind blows stronger, the ripple gradually becomes a chop. And then the chop becomes a sea, a confused sea, because the storm is going like this, and so you have waves coming in all directions. As the sea leaves the storm, it gradually smooths out and becomes swell, traveling across the sea as a group. Now, something at this point, which is very complicated, happens. The group is moving only half as fast as the individual waves, because the first wave in the group will die out only to be replaced at the back of the group by another wave. So the group itself will go exactly half the speed as the individual waves. Now, I've never been able to figure out why that just happens. You ask the physicists, the hydrodynamicists, why that happens, well, they can give you an equation, and that's about it. Now, when a wave gets close to land, it starts feeling, quote, the bottom. It feels the bottom when the depth is about one half the wavelength which typically is about 200 to 300 feet deep. So when the waves start coming in to depths less than 200 feet, they start to, to build. And that's, again, because the cone of energy underneath the wave is being compressed up. So the wave begins to build. The front part of the wave is slowing down faster than the back part. And so that causes it to take the shape of a curl. And then it becomes very, very high, and then it becomes unstable and starts to break. Waves break differently depending on the shape of the seabed. Surging breakers come from deep water over steep beaches. They're of little use to the surfer. Spilling breakers develop over gradual slopes, providing smooth, fast waves for the novice. Plunging breakers have a barrel shape with a hollow face. They form where the seabed gets shallow abruptly, and they are the waves which experienced surfers love the best. In their search for the perfect wave, surfers hold one place more precious than all others. The Hawaiian island of Oahu has been known since Polynesian times as the gathering place. shore offers a greater variety of wave than anywhere else, from 12 inches to 30 foot and over. Local shapers call the North Shore the laboratory of surf. Move it. Get on the road. What do you think this is? <laughs> on our left, camis. So the best watermen in the world, the lifeguards, water safety. And coming up already, Sunset Beach. Some of the most consistent, powerful, rideable waves year round. Let's go check Mike out, see if he's here. Hey, what are you girls up to? Nothing, going surfing, how about you? I don't know, I was gonna see if uh, Mike's down here. Hey. Hey. What are you doing? Getting ready for winter, of course. The big waves here demand big boards. Called elephant guns or rhino chasers, they marry the flexible performance of the short board to the dimensions of the long board. The Willis twins navigate the extremes of big gun design. How about this one, Milton? This is a 10-5. You can tell in reference to me, it's designed for big waves. Uh, Mike and I have surfed maybe 15 to 20. This winter didn't get too big, really. It only got about 20 feet. You can tell by the length and by the thickness, how thick this board is. It's designed to catch waves. The reason that it has to be heavy is because when you're catching a large face wave, and you're trying to penetrate, there's a lot of wind blowing up the face. So what happens is you're trying to catch that wave as hard as you can, and you stand up and the wind holds you up. The extra weight helps you bring the board down the face quicker. 
Your back foot go right over here. Your front foot go over here. You have a steering wheel for your back foot and an accelerator pedal for your front foot. That's where you get all your speed by leaning forward. Lean back and you can control the board real easy. It's with a weight shift. And this one's a phaser bottom. When you're surfing, water's not just flowing in one direction, end over end. When you put pressure on the tail, water's displaced in every direction. So the water might enter this way, and as you turn, the water's gonna go out this way, and as you adjust your weight, it might come back this way. It's in a continual state of change. We found that the water crossed the leading edge of the phaser dish, okay, at high speed. It compresses, which gives the board the lift, and then decompresses. When it's compressing, it's vacuuming the bubbles up forward, it's holding on to the face of the wave at higher speed. Originally, some of the professional, young, open-minded surfers, before they tested the board, there was people saying it's gonna stop. It's gonna stop dead in the water, it's not gonna go, or it's gonna fly off the face of the wave. Don't do it, don't even try it. And they were laughing at us, and they were calling them the dent boards and the bump board, and they were, they, they, people were laughing and there was at also this design. Pe pe people who said that the earth was square. Exactly. There was also people who said riding 25 and 30 foot waves under your own Impossible. manpower Impossible. couldn't be done. This, this design has set world class speed records in the windsurfing world. It's ridden the largest waves there are to ride as well as the smallest in the surfing world. It's ridden in the bodyboard world, the scurfer world. It's, it's influenced the entire surf wave riding vehicles, water, motion craft. Check this board out. This is one of my all time favorites. This board was designed to ride the largest wave ever ridden. 13.2. <laughs> now this is designed to ride the largest wave ever ridden, but under human power. Today, of course, we know that people are being towed in by jet skis, they're being towed in by boats. You can take a helicopter and drop off, you can do anything you want, but this board is essentially <laughs> designed for human manpower. That is paddling yourself right into the wave, the way it was done with Duke Kahanamoku. It's a side profile. This gives you a kind of an idea of the thickness that it takes to get the speed up for paddling because the waves are moving, traveling very fast across the ocean and they're hard to catch on your own power. Beast of a board for beast of waves. The beasts. If the North Shore is surfing's Camelot, then Waimea Bay is its holy grail. It produces the largest rideable waves in the world. I remember when I was a kid, I used to sit at Waimea Bay and just watch the guys ride the biggest waves, you know? And when I was a child, I was just, it was the scariest thing you could imagine, you know, as a kid. You'd watch the guys on the biggest boards, and, you know, you couldn't even carry a board that big. And it was much less think about going out there, you know? And then, you know, life goes on, and then, you know, the, you grow up with the world, you know? And next thing you know, you're out there with all the big guys and getting the waves, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Waimea is as tranquil as you can imagine right now and all summer long, and even some days out of the winter, because without a storm, without something generating all this surf, there is no surf. So wintertime is when we surf. And that old cliche, the endless summer, has nothing to do with surfing. <laughs> it's just dreaming of days that used to be. Wintertime, it's the endless winter. That's what we're looking for. The big surf on the north shore of Oahu comes from storms that sweep off the coast of Japan. They gather energy by virtue of moving over warm water into the North Pacific Drift. So you have cold air moving over warm water and suddenly these storms start developing into massive lows with winds 55, 65, sometimes 70 knots. A thousand miles of 60 knot winds for a day 
that gives you 40 foot seas, 45, 50 foot seas. By the time those seas get to Hawaii, they've decayed to maybe 30 or 25, but then they hit our island shelves and boom, they're back up to being 30, 40, even 50 foot waves. I've seen 50 foot waves right here. And that was produced by a 65 knot wind blowing 24 hours for 1,000 miles. How do you catch a wave that's that large? Um, it's funny, because most people imagine a wave, you, turn, you see it coming, you turn around, you paddle, 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 and it kind of lifts you up and you go. And when it's coming at you, it's coming at you like, kind of like a, like literally, like the side of a building. It's not just this little tall little thing like this. It's like, you know, it's like 100 yards, maybe 200 yards across. And you're paddling up the face, and you're looking at it, and you're looking at the direction you want to go. And you're paddling up going, yeah, I think I can do this one. It's getting steep enough. It's not going to be too steep. And you hopefully can get enough speed that it won't just pass you by and throw you tail first out over the wave. And you try to get you know, enough paddling speed as you're going up the face that you go to your feet, and then you just stand up on this sheer vertical side of a building and just put everything on edge and just force it down. There's wind howling up the face around you, and you're trying to hold that nose down, and you're pushing it down, pushing it down, and sometimes it literally comes up in your face, and you shove it back down again and drive it back down in that hole. And then you get to the bottom, <laughs> and then you really have to start pushing with your legs and your body, and you cock over it, and everything just gets really... Surfing's a physical sport, <laughs> you know? It's the forces of nature. I mean, the ultimate forces of nature, it's the this, this sun's energy, which powers our whole universe transferred into the wind, which anybody that's seen that what a, a hurricane or a typhoon or a cyclone does, you know, or, or felt 60 mile an hour winds, and then that energy is transferred into the, into the water, into the ocean, and, and you're tapped into it, and you're pushing against it, and it's pushing against you, and you're feeling, you know, the solar energy and the, the energy of 9.4 millibar storms and the, and the ocean, through your feet, which are about like this big, you know, and that's a lot of charge in a little area. So that's what the, the, the rush is all about, you know, it's the, it's the power. It's unbelievable. That's why the boards have to be designed the way they're designed. They're designed with the right combination of rocker, the right rail line, the right plan shape in order to get the most carry, but yet with the most performance. So you can turn up on the face and you can still maneuver the surfboard. The old days, they used to just make these parallel big wave guns and just take off and go, ah, I just charge for the shoulder, you know. Well, my first memories of riding Waimea are uh, sort of like one disaster after another disaster <laughs> because we didn't have the, the equipment. We didn't have boards. I was riding a surfboard, which was uh, euphemistically called a pig board. It had a tail like a, the hind end of a pig. It was round and made it very easy to turn on a three or four foot wave. But when you took off in an 18 foot elevator, it was just completely out of control. And so my first year or so, I did a lot of falling. I remember one afternoon, the waves were, it was solid, probably 20 feet, and uh, the bay, Waimea, was literally like an arena. There was people parked all the way around the whole Waimea Bay, standing on their cars. The waves were as good as they can be, and uh, Shane Haran had taken off on this one wave and just came around the bottom of the thing, and it was just so big, it just, it overtake, it just overtook him is what it looked like to me. The wave just was so big and the energy of the wave and the, and the ocean had so much power that day that the whales were very active and we had seen some whales that day. And right as Shane Horan had gotten just drilled by that wave, simultaneously this whale just boosted out of the back, maybe not even 100 yards behind the lineup and just caught probably, the whale had to have been 40 feet long and it caught 40, it went all the way out of the water and just laid back on its side. And you could hear the people through the whole bay and it echoed and people were applaud, yeah, like that. And it was a really heartful thing. It really did good for the heart that day for surfing. And I don't know, a real surfer kind of gets a little soul out of that when it happens. For the big wave rider, there are only two options, a triumphant ride or a comprehensive wipeout. How do you survive wipeouts? It's not a point of issue of how you survive them. You're going to survive them. This is, a, this is a given. You're going to survive this. Some wipeouts are really fun. You get hit, you get blasted. You're going, wow, that was radical. That was unreal. Look, you know, that was unreal. And sometimes you can't believe how bad, I mean, 
Your wetsuit's gone. Your watch is gone. You don't know where these things go. They're just gone, you know? And you come up and go, cool, I'm still here. That by any means is um, only a playground to a few people in this world because um, I've been surfing now since I was about eight years old and uh, you know for me to pal out at YMA and have a real serious attitude and think I'm going to go out there and rip is uh, you know I, you got another thing coming you know what I mean that, that's a real serious place to go play. This four mile stretch of ocean right here will take lives on a winter basis it's a sad thing. Southern California has surf plus space age technology. High tech shortboards have got so specialized in shape that scope for future refinement probably lies in new materials. Huntington Beach, the original surf city, is at the center of these innovations. Bill, got Ryan's board. Chuck Burns oh, is a consultant to the defense oh, industry, yes. looking for peacetime applications for military hardware. His boards use epoxy resins, Kevlar, and carbon fiber. Yeah, right now I would have to say that the next advancement is going to have to come in materials. They've got resins today that, that are hundreds of times stronger than the resins of yesteryear. See what we're talking about here uh, in the dynamics of surfboards is the evolution of a surfboard. Okay, we've got a, a technology that actually grew out of the Cold War. We've got a polyester resin on a polyurethane foam. It's 30 years old. How many other technologies exist in the world today that are 30 years old that aren't antiquated? But right now, We're past the Cold War, and just like every other technology advanced, surfboards have advanced. There's stuff out there, cutting edge things that, that people might have heard of, but they've never seen anything. Like in my pocket, I've got a fin that is, well, actually 10 times as light as a normal fiberglass fin, but it's, That's strong. it's stronger. I mean, not that I'm Hercules or Schwarzenegger or anything, but it's stronger. This is where the future is. You have to consider in the surfboard industry something called planned obsolescence. You want the board to uh, break down, so they'll buy another one. We have materials that we're making boards out of that we can make indestructible surfboards. But until the public's ready to accept a surfboard that doesn't break, we're not going to build them. We can do it. I do it. I have boards at my shop, my, my glassing factory that I experiment on that we've shot, we've shot 22s at, and all it does is mar the surface. Development has gone all kind of directions. We've tried concave bottoms, we've tried channel bottoms, we've tried compression release channel bottoms, we've tried uh, V, less V, no V, Reverse V, uh, double concaves, single concaves. 
it's a very trial and error sport. We do most of our design and trial and error and research on a day-to-day -day basis right in the water. So we'll keep trying out and we'll keep finding out. The Willis twins approach is to think the unthinkable. What happens if you remove one crucial design element? It's surfing back to basics. There's no set rules. It's, it's a matter of the combination and continually coming up with different shaped fins. Mike and I are actually working on a design that doesn't even require a fin. It's a whole other application of curves, whole other application of scientific design. Totally unconventional board. The widest part of this board is in the rear, in the back. This being the tail. So what will happen is turn it sideways like this, Milton. The rider will be able to stand on this end on maybe a two foot wave, a four foot wave, a five foot wave, and this nose will be out of the way. So he'll be basically using about this point here back to surf on hopefully a little surfboard about that big. With the increased width here, it's gonna definitely increase the speed to a point that on a big wave it wouldn't work, but on a small wave, It'll support the weight of a 150, 200 pound man on a small surfboard like this. It'll be much like riding a skateboard. This is a channel set up here in the, in the nose, and this is an attempt to combine the classic longboard nose, nose rider board with today's modern surfing. We're making an attempt here, an experiment. And our experiment is with, with these channels here in this round nose is to be able to nose ride, to be able to hang five, get that nose off and be in the front and have nothing in front of you but water itself. Back here is positioned specifically for turning, for doing roller coasters, and the board's length is so short that it really adds to maneuverability. New materials and radical design will always find a place in the world of international competitions, where performance levels are highest. Hi, I'm Ted Deerhurst, and in spite of my American accent, I was actually Britain's first professional surfer, and I've been competing since 1978, representing Britain on the World Professional Surfing Tour. After you come up through the amateur ranks, you start entering professional events. You go out in the water with four other guys for 20 minutes, and you're allowed to ride 10 waves. Of that, every single wave is scored by a panel of judges, and your highest three or four scores will be a total together, and you'll advance to the next round like a tennis tournament. You'll be trying to do as many maneuvers as you can in the critical hollow part of the wave, the steepest part of the wave. If the wave is going slower than you are, you might come around and do a roundhouse cut back, back up into the breaking part of the wave. But what you're going to try to do if you're a modern competitive surfer is you're going to try and be on that edge where you are just like one little lean away from disaster, but also riding at the edge where you are doing the most radical thing that can possibly be done with the energy that that wave possesses. And basically, the judges are going to give you the most points for being the most radical, controlled surfer in the water at that time. Though competitive surfing attracts serious prize money and media coverage, it has its drawbacks. It's totally dependent on local wind and wave conditions, which are always changing. The judging is subjective, and the arena often far away from the spectator. So the ocean doesn't really offer a level playing field. Top pro surfers dream of the repeatable mechanical wave. These climate-free waves break in the middle of a Norwegian pine forest. We take water from a source like a river or a pool of some type, pump it up into a reservoir in this particular application, and then it, we have gates, control gates, that allow the water to come out in a particular thickness over the over the ride surface and we'd create a separated sheet flow that allowed us to uh, make what appears to be a tunneling wave when in fact it's an illusion of a wave. We've got Kelly Slater who's one of the top surfers, Terry A. Hawkinson one of the top snowboarders, we've got Tony Hawk who's one of the top skaters and as we got into it more and we really learned what we had it is well it's a crossover between surfing, snowboarding, skateboarding in terms of a venue, you have something that, that's very compact and tight that allows for people to be able to look and get very close up to the competitor, which is unlike surfing currently, where you have these huge outdoor natural areas. You're able to get the people just right up on top, 
there's a whole number of commercial offshoots that one could tie into this application. You have the perfect television angles. Let's say that you have your competitor riding right in here. Well, the cameraman could be situated right next to him as he's doing his maneuvers. It allows a repeatable experience that for a contestant having contests would be more akin to gymnastics. But far from the world of water parks, the challenge of the ocean reigns supreme. The hardcore are pioneering the outer reefs, miles from the north shore of Oahu. The big question is, everybody keeps asking me, how big can you ride? Well, how big a wave can be ridden? And uh, some of us believe because catching it is such a difficult thing, because you don't catch it in a conventional way whatsoever. You literally have to be going up the face and literally, as it gets steeper, to realize that this is enough and you can turn around and then go. And the question is, as it gets so steep and it gets so big, this area here, how much can you bridge? Can you bridge 10 feet? Can you bridge 20 feet? I mean, at what point does it, do you just become just falling? And so therefore, it may be humanly impossible to ride a 40-foot wave under your own power. And so that's why the toe-in concept is getting more and more accepted and practiced. These motion devices, or javelins have you, are basically for the next step that Melton and I are working on, which is being towed in by powered jet skis. The jet skis go at a remarkable speed, maybe 10 times faster than we could ever paddle into a wave. As a matter of fact, it's being done right now by Derek Doner, Laird Hamilton, and Buzzy Kerbox. When these boards are completed, we'll have foot straps on them, and we'll do uniform single fins and tri-fins. One will be a tri-fin, one will be a single fin. We'll experiment with them from there. Being towed in by wave runners and jet skis is just something that they've started doing in the, um, it's the early 90s is when that started, actually. So now we're developing boards just specifically for that. But it's, again, it's the unknown. So we take this and we're going to go from here. Skis to surf on. Avalanches of water. I mean, these waves, are, why may look silly? You know, these are perfect, giant, barreling, uh, walls, you know, they're as, as, as perfect as any of the waves that there are, except they're huge. Every single morning when I'm leaving, and I'm down there at 5 in the morning, every goddamn morning I'm there and I see them all getting ready, standing on the blocks, just staring out there and ready to go. They don't know why. I don't know why, but why would you get up 5 o'clock in the morning to get out there and sit there and sit there on a surfboard freezing in the winter? Waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and then paddling like a son of a bitch. And all it does is the wave just bows over you and you didn't catch it. And you go back out there and you go back out there and then you hit that wave and you catch it. Do you remember your dad throwing you up in the air? Because where, who else can throw you like your dad did when you were young but a wave? Cast you and it's bigger than you, then form around you and squeeze you. Now here you're in a womb, you're with your mom. It's water, it's water that does it. It's a lot more than ego. It's a lot more than look at me. It's genetic. They can't help it. They really can't. Stop and think about it. Every surfer has this universal wish as the sun's going down. I mean, you can't stand it. It is beautiful. And you're looking at it, and every surfer starts to whisper under their breath, I wish I had two more hours. If only I had two more hours. Teacher's guide is available, price £4.95. To buy the guide, please write, making a cheque payable to the Educational Television Company Limited, P.O. Box 100, Warwick CV 34 6TZ, 
or call 01926 433333.